briefly recognize the man way off to my right here in the orange shirt, Mark D'Antonio, Senior Project uh, Director, Senior Programs Director for the MBA, and then John Craigman, uh, Member Relations uh, Manager at the MBA. Both of them are alums of this school and have been helpful for five years in a row to partner with us to put on this conference. I now want to introduce Will Piper. He's the editor-in-chief of the Uniform Commercial Code Digest over at Washington College. I'll be very brief, but he comes from Albuquerque. He came east. He went to school in Charlottesville, Virginia. And then he came up here to go to law school at Boston College Law School. He's uh, achieved very high honors at this school. He was a summer associate with a firm in New York. I think it's Warwick, Harrington, and Sutcliffe. And I believe you have an offer on going back to New York to go to work. Now, I want to say that these students at the UCC Reporter Digest, by vote, vote to put up money to help defray expenses here. So we are very thankful and appreciate your being here. And also, if anybody wants to talk to you about the Digest, here's the man. All right, thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm excited to be here on behalf of the Digest. Uh, we're celebrating our 52nd year in operation at Boston College Law School. And we produce annotations of commercial law cases. We annotate every single article of the UCC. We see a lot of Article 2 and Article 9 in particular. But we produce case law annotations, about 160 of them a year. And each annotation is just a snapshot of a case. And it's meant to help practitioners stay up to date on current case law, but save them time. So our official model that we've adopted is annotating for hours and advising in minutes. And our goal is to take a long case and really reduce it down to the key facts and holdings and reasoning and save practitioners time. So we sell our product through LexisNexis and the Matthew Bender Company. We're available online in print uh, as well. Uh, and we're actually working right now uh, with Lexis, hopefully to get a uh, smartphone app or an um, iPad version available soon. Uh, the Mass Bar Association was nice enough to let me put some of our materials, uh, an example of our hard copy over there, so you can see what uh, our product looks like. Uh, we're under the direction of Professor Hillinger over at Boston College. Uh, she filters everything that, that's going to be published, uh, so you know it's worthy when it goes out. And uh, we're excited to be here today. Thanks a lot. Is your managing editor, Justin Beagle, with you? No. He's, he's coming tonight. Okay, that's good. Uh, I'll introduce my colleague, Eric Lustig, if I can... Okay. Ah, right here, right here. All right. Just a brief introduction, Eric. I'll be brief. He's a numbers man. He was a CPA before he went to law school. Uh, he's one who got his LLM in tax at the University of Florida School of Law. Uh, he's been here since 1993. He teaches taxes, business organizations, products liability, and the basic torts course. I've served with Eric here for 23 years. He's a good friend, a fine professor. And he's the director of our Center for Business Law. You can make this brief, right? You can make it brief. Okay. As brief as you want. It's getting briefer. Um, I really just want to thank, um, well, I want to extend our thanks along with everyone else's and you're welcome. And particularly on behalf of the deans, I want to thank everyone for coming to this, uh, what's become the signature conference. And thanks, Gary, for five years of great conferences. Um, so, um, the Center for Business Law is one of three centers at the school. We have the Center for International Law and Policy, with whom we're co-sponsoring this project, and that's a lot of fun, and the Center for Law and Social Responsibility. Basically, all of the centers are here to help students work with faculty and to work with members of the bar on, on important and practical legal issues like the conference we have in front of us. So I think I'll leave the rest of our introduction for the, or the rest of the content as the Center for Business Law take a look at our materials on the uh, web and I think I'll let you start the conference. So thanks again for all your help. I know Professor Dean McGovern will be the moderator of the first panel pointed out that on our program we don't say who the point person is for our Center on Business Law. If somebody wants to contact our center, the point person is Professor Eric Lustig. E. Lustig at Nestle.edu. Yeah. So give him a shout if you want to suggest a program or in any manner, 
work with our Center for Business Law. I want to recognize a couple people, one of whom will be on the panel at 4 o'clock, and that's uh, Attorney Steve Chow. He's a commissioner from Massachusetts, Uniform Law Commissioner since 1994, and practitioner adjunct professor Frank Morrissey, who is in prior years been a moderator. He's a good friend of the school and teaches secure transactions and uh, negotiable instruments and the like here. Now, I want to introduce the conference itself with just a very few words. Since we've started, our main objective has to been to bring together three different groups of persons. First of all, we want to bring together professors, teaching here and elsewhere, either as full-time or adjunct professors. Some of the participants we've had in past years have been fantastic. I can tell you that everybody whom we've recruited this year has made monumental achievements in their areas of expertise. The second thing we want to do is induce some practitioners to come in and participate. And the first persons I met here were some practitioners. And I'm very pleased that you saw some merit in what's on the program. And thirdly, we want to bring in the students. And I have a class of 51 in sales. My colleague, uh, Wayne Lewis, has 39. So there'll be students drifting in and out. Uh, some of them have classes, uh, so if they come and go, don't feel insulted. But we want to bring together and have brought together these three groups. Now, I want to stress to everybody, we do not aim to try to empower somebody to master uh, any doctrine in the short period of time we allow. We do aim for meaningful exposure, meaningful exposure, to current issues, to relevant bodies of law, and law in the making. And I am very confident that with the panelists we've got, we can achieve those aims under the general topic, selling goods into foreign markets. Now, I'll let uh, Professor Dean Peter McGovern introduce the members of the first panel, but I need to say just a few words about him. More than 40 years ago, I was a school teacher and ranch hand on the high plains of western South Dakota. I wandered down to Vermilion, South Dakota, where the university is, as a late applicant at law school. And the first person whom I interviewed was then a very young associate dean in recovery. Somehow, I was put on a wait list and admitted. I thought it was that or I was going to go to the outback in Australia. <laughs> but it's been a great life in the law. Then Peter McGovern went on to be the dean of four American law schools, the founding dean of Notre Dame Law School in Sydney, Australia. He's visited in numer at numerous law schools abroad and in the U.S. of A. He and his wife, Kate, are currently teaching as adjunct professors at the University of Connecticut. And I'm very pleased to say, spring semester, he is going to teach international business transactions here at New England Law Boston. By asking you to be a moderator, I did not want to give you heavy lifting. I really wanted to expose you to our legal academic community and let a few people get to know you. So, Professor Van Elstein will be first, Professor Johnson second, Arbitrator uh, O'Neill third. So, take it away. Thank you. Terry, that was very kind of you. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Welcome to Selling Goods in Foreign Markets. I would like to commend Professor Gary Munster, the New England Law of Boston, the Centers for Business Law, and the Centers for International Law and Policy for producing such an outstanding program today with such a prominent faculty who have committed so generously of their valuable time and recognized expertise and talent to the program. Our first panel will discuss the transactional sales current issues, and as Gary just introduced them, um, they will be speaking in the order that is listed in the program. Their credentials are extremely impressive. You want to hear them, not me. Their credentials show up on page 9 and 10 of the brochure that you have. And I'm deeply honored to have the opportunity to be the moderator, the moderator today and to be here at New England Law Boston. And uh, I'm particularly excited that Professor Van Elsky is going to speak first because I have adopted his textbook to be used for the class coming this spring. So thank you very much. So 
So I'm Michael Van Alstein. I teach in this field in particular. Uh, the CISG has been my background. Uh, did my doctoral thesis on some of the issues that we talked about today. So if I start to get excited and foam at the mouth and ride around, it does that. <laughs> so I have a cute little PowerPoint presentation for this. And I begin. I begin with an apology. I begin with an apology of using the word malpractice in this context. Law professors easily use that word because there's very little likelihood of us ever being accused of it. <laughs> but I do begin with a little bit of a cautionary note because. In the recent years, the last four or five years, there have been five cases by my count of lawyers that have been involved in a sale of goods transaction and discovered midway through the litigation that the, they've been arguing under the UCC, and then they discover that, in fact, this treaty that I'm about to talk about, the CISG, governs the transaction, governed it right from the beginning, and, in fact, the treaty is better for their, for their clients' interests. And at that moment, these four or five cases, the courts have said, it's too late to change your theory of the case. Even though it's right in that there is supreme federal law that governs this transaction, not the UCC, it's too late for you to change your theory, and we're going to continue on under the wrong body of law. So that's the background. And to set up the CISG and why it matters is the question, whenever a transaction touches on the interests certainly of more than one state, but of, of more than one country as well, we have that fundamental question of, well, what body of law applies? What is the, to, where do I look to find the rules that will govern our transaction? And under the UCC, I think by polite description, the choice of law question is a mess. And it is a mess because the rule in Article 2 of the UCC is we apply the UCC if this state bears a, quote, appropriate relation to the transaction. Well, what the heck does appropriate relation mean? And courts have said, I don't know what appropriate relation means, so what I'm going to do is do the restatement test. The restatement test, which is the most significant relationship test. But for that, a, ju a, a judge must be a great juggler indeed, because under the, relation to the most significant relationship test, the judge must weigh seven choice of law principles and five contacts, all 12 of these things, to decide what body of law applies. And the bottom line simply is, you cannot predict in advance what's going to happen. That's the background that sets up the need for some kind of solution. Of course, of course each country has their own choice of law principles. And although I don't have this up here, the one thing that may shock you is that you absolutely cannot predict in advance with a transaction that touches on the interests of more than one country. You cannot predict in advance what law is going to apply to your transaction because you can't predict where the lawsuit's going to be filed. And if you can't predict where the lawsuit's going to be filed, you don't know what the choice of law rules are because the forum will apply its own choice of law rules. And because you don't know where the lawsuit's going to be filed, you can't know what the choice of law rules are. If you can't know what the choice of law rules are, you can't pre predict what country's laws are going to apply to the transaction. That sets up the need for an international treaty. And that treaty for sale of goods transactions is the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, the CISG, that's a mouthful, pretty much every place on earth, even other countries with different, uh, say different languages, everybody calls it the CISG. This may be familiar to the sophisticated people in this group, but I'm hoping to highlight some things that might not jump out at you from just sitting down and reading the CISG in the evening with your loved one and the wine. Is <laughs> so, the U.S. ratified this treaty in 1986. It entered into effect in 1988. And this is the law professor in me that just wanted to take this opportunity to say the CISG is the definitive rejoinder to when people say there's no such thing as international law. This is a hard, fast, serious rejoinder because this is international law. And as we will see, 
his law in the United States as well. All of the people in this room have been to law school, but I suspect nearly none of us actually covered this part of the Constitution in constitutional law. We don't talk about treaties in constitutional law for reasons that are a complete mystery to me, but treaties under the Supremacy Clause are fully binding federal law. Notice all treaties are the supreme law of the land. Now, unfortunately, all treaties doesn't mean all treaties. The Supreme Court will say, I'll show you in a moment. Uh, although this is a bit dated, it's the most recent st study of which I'm aware. Uh, in 2008, about eight years ago, uh, only 30% of practitioners said that they were at least moderately familiar with the CISG. Only 30%. And 82% of judges said Biden never even heard of him. Uh, something worthy of our uh, at least noting, if not, if not in the margins, uh, tattooed on our foreheads. So the knowledge of this is important for the simple reason that the CISG is something called a self-executing treaty. This is not just uh, law professor words. You'll notice I have a quote from an opinion here. Uh, and a self-executing treaty is a treaty that by itself is supreme federal law. Now this is kind of weird because you can't find this. If you go to the U.S. Code, this is, the, the CISG is nowhere in the U.S. Code. It is nowhere in the U.S. Code. It's law, it's binding federal law, but you really can't find it anywhere. It is, I kid you not, maintained by the State Department, along with 15,000 other acts that the United States, have, has, uh, the United States has uh, done that the State Department says are international law agreements. That's where the CISG is. Just another quick note in the margin. <coughs> on my calculations, there are about 500 and some self-executing treaties that fall into this category. Just as a, a background note for the fancy word of a self-executing treaty. The idea of a self-executing treaty is one that is federal law. And this particular federal law creates a federal cause of action. It is by itself, the CISG creates a cause of action that you can assert in federal court. And because it arises under a treaty, federal courts have jurisdiction to hear the claims. A note about uh, what treaties would not be self-executing treaties. A simple thought to have in your head is if the U.S. concludes an uh, anti-ballistic missile treaty with Russia and the president decides not to do something that's required under the treaty, you can't run off to federal court and make the president destroy a missile. That's the idea of a non-self-executing treaty. But the CISG is perhaps the classic example of a treaty that is immediately binding federal law and preemptive federal law. It preempts the UCC, it preempts the common law. So, why does this matter as a substantive thing? That is, the CISG is federal law. We're, I'll talk in just a moment in a couple of slides about when the CISG applies. But as a note to let you know that what you're hearing here is, at least I'd like to think important, is 85 countries have ratified the treaty along with the United States. And it is essentially every major trading country on Earth. Every major trading country on Earth. Except, for those of you following international politics, the one country that refuses now it refuses to participate in inter international treaty making at all, and those international treaties that it has uh, adopted, it votes to get out of, and that's the UK. So the UK is not a member state of the CISG, neither is Ireland, Portugal, India, or South Africa. Those are the principal players. If I had done this presentation seven or eight years ago, I would have added Brazil and uh, Japan to that list. Both Brazil and Japan have come, or come around in the last six or seven years. About three countries each year, three to five countries each year join the list. As a result, look at when the CISG applies. Oh, sorry, I forgot to do this one. That's, for those of you who are better visual learners, you'll see the blue there. Those are the countries that have ratified the CISG. So when does the CISG apply? 
the CISG applies by its terms, under Article 1, to contracts for the sale of goods who, to, between parties whose places of business are in different states when both of those states are so-called contracting states. And I'm really proud of myself when I discovered how to do this on PowerPoint. <laughs> if, you make, if you make the things blow up there, that means there are three elements to this. A sale of goods, that is a, a sale of movable things, between parties whose places of business are in different countries, if both of those countries are contracting states. It's a term of art in international uh, treaties. A contracting state is just means a state, a state that has ratified the treaty, a country that has ratified the treaty. You'll notice as a little note something that is not stated there. And what is not stated there is it doesn't matter where the goods are. It doesn't matter where the goods are going. The goods themselves do not have to cross borders. It's entirely possible for goods sitting in a warehouse here in Boston. They never leave Boston. They've been in Boston the entire time. The CISG could govern the sale of those goods because it, the key thing is the, where the parties have their places of business. That places of business uh, is a 45-minute conversation. Uh, but importantly, it is not the place where you're incorporated. It's entirely possible for a branch office or a sales office to be a place of business. So, the CISG also has this alternative. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because this alternative doesn't apply in the United States. But being a law professor, I just have to do one thing. When the rules of private international law lead to the application of the law of the contracting state, reading that, you probably have no idea what those words mean. What it means is the, the rules of private international law are a civil law way of saying choice of law rules. The idea of choice of law rules is if the forum's choice of law rules point to just one member state, just one, then the CISG applies. The idea, and uh, this doesn't matter, uh, the idea is imagine that a US party is doing a transaction with a party located in the UK. The UK is not a member state of the CISG. Under this provision, if the lawsuit's filed here in Boston, and the court in Boston says, oh, we're going to apply Massachusetts law. Massachusetts, part of the United States. Under this provision, then the CISG would go. But the CISG lets states declare that that provision doesn't apply to them. The US and just a very few, four or five of the 85, have said that that provision does not apply to us. That is, our courts don't have to do this choice of law analysis. Now, it does apply in the other 80 or so uh, member states. I think it's, it's less likely that you would have to deal with that. But I will note, I'm going to come back and talk about this provision with regard to a completely different treaty way at the end. So we'll come back and explain that a little bit more. The bottom idea is that that provision doesn't apply in the United States. So, simple idea, summary moment. If you would, if your client is doing a transaction with a party that's in a different country, the alarms should go up that maybe the CISG would govern this transaction. And it is increasingly becoming true that if a client is doing a transaction with, with someone who's not in the United States, the CISG will govern the transaction. The CISG, however, does not apply to consumers. It sales directly to consumers, unlike the UCC. So, just a bit of structural background. We obviously do not have time in uh, 40 minutes or so to talk about all of, that. okay, that's a formatting glitch there, uh, all of the CISG. The CISG governs contract formation and the rights and obligations of the parties, the buyer and the seller. That is what the seller has to do, what the buyer has to do, and importantly, and we're going to focus most of our attention on the formation issues. Uh, there's also part four of diplomatic provisions, those treaty stuff, like withdrawal and depositing instruments of ratification. So here comes myth number one. Well, I don't have to worry about the CISG because I'll just choose Massachusetts law. I will choose Massachusetts law, and therefore I don't have to worry about the CISG. And in fact, it's true. Under CISG Article 6, the parties may agree to exclude the application of the CISG. That's entirely correct. But there's a lot less here than that simple phrase might tell us. First, 
if the parties, the parties may agree to exclude the application of the CISG. Thus, there's no such thing as a one-sided exclusion of the CISG. Second, a choice of Massachusetts law is a choice of the CISG because Massachusetts is part of the United States. And under the Supremacy Clause, the CISG is the law of Massachusetts. There have been a fair number of cases like this where someone chooses the law of a particular state of the United States, and the court says, yeah, you chose the law of the United States, and the CISG is the law of the United States, you've just chosen the CISG. Uh, there have been a fair number of cases, courts, the U.S. courts have done a very good job on this, of uh, pointing out exactly what I just said. I'll give you a recent example there. Third, the courts have also said, if you want to exclude the CISG, even the parties, you must do it affirmatively by mentioning the CISG by name. Courts have been pretty doctrinaire on this. You must actually mention the CISG, along with the words like exclude or get rid of or destroy, things like that. And it must be done so called clearly and unequivocally. So even if you wanted to choose Massachusetts law, you have to make sure that you're choosing Massachusetts law to the exclusion of and express, expressly mentioning the CISG. Next myth. Well, I'll just change my standard business terms. And I've been to a conference that said this out loud, so I'm just going to go back, change my standard business terms, and put in, in big bold letters, uh, we hereby exclude, the parties hereby exclude the application of the CISG. <coughs> bing, bang, boom, we don't have to worry about the CISG. Well, again, you need the agreement of the parties. Your standard business terms are not in agreement of the parties. I he was telling uh, Professor Monster about this uh, just before. They, what actually inspired uh, this part of my presentation, uh, seven years ago I was at a conference just like this. Uh, the, the conference was over. The, there was a chief general counsel of this huge international, multinational corporation that sells things all over the planet. I sat down next to this person afterwards, and, and he very, very politely said, you know, very nice presentation, but the thing that you don't get is that we exclude the CISG in all of our standard business terms, so we don't have to worry about the CISG. And I, I did, did, I just did that. I did, I don't know what to say. I did not know what to say, because putting it in your standard business terms doesn't mean that the parties have agreed. So, you can't know in advance whether your standard business terms are part of the contract. And again, you can't do it on a one-sided basis. Even if you're the offeror, if your offer says, see my standard business terms, and my standard business terms exclude the application of the CISG, you don't know if that offer actually becomes part of the contract, becomes a foundation, and whether your standard business terms are part of that contract. So you can't know that in advance. And because you can't do that in advance, through your standard business terms, you don't know what the contract formation rules are. Actually, you will know what the contract formation rules are. They're the CISG's contract formation rules. Your standard business terms, even if they choose to exclude the CISG, you can't get away from the CISG because you need the contract formation rules of the CISG to tell you whether your standard business terms are part of the contract. You can't exclude the, the contract formation rules in the CISG. This Hanwha Corp of Court did a really wonderful examination. In that transaction, the seller's form chose the law of Singapore. The buyer's form chose the law, I guess I got that backward. The buyer chose New York. The seller chose Singapore. They exchanged their standard business terms. And the two of them said, well, each of them said, we have to, we've agreed. We have agreed that CISG is not going to govern. The problem was, the court said, I don't know if that's part of the contract or that's part of the contract, and the only way I can know whether they're part of the contract, whether either one of these is part of the contract, is by doing the CISG's contract formation rules. So in a certain sense, you can't exclude the contract formation rules of the CISG, because you oh, except, except if you were to sit down before you do the transaction and agree 
that the CISG's contract formation rules are not going to apply. Of course, as you might imagine, that's a very rare occurrence. Third, those contract formation rules, in many respects, are very different from the contract formation rules that we are all familiar with. And in particular, this relates to the so-called battle of the forms. So I'm just going to put a clause in my standard business terms that say my standard business terms always apply. And you agree with that. Uh, if you're with me at this point, you'll immediately see that that just can't help you because you don't know whether that even that agreement, that supposed agreement, is part of the contract. First, see above. That is, you can't know in advance whether that supposed provision is part of the contract in the first place. Second, the CISG's Battle of the Forms rules are really quite different. You can't even assume, not only can you, it, they are different. And as a result, unless you know the rules of the, of the CISG, you cannot know in advance. Even if you know the rules of the CISG, you can't know exactly what's going to happen unless you understand them at a pretty detailed, uh, at a pretty detailed basis. I actually have said quite a bit on this subject matter, and the U.S. courts are starting to come, along, come around to recognize this. You'll notice the case quotes I have there to recognize that the CISG's contract formation rules, and in particular its Battle of Forms rules, are really different. And the weird thing about the Battle of Forms rules is when they were drafting the CISG, it was a law professor food fight because the professors who were involved, this was mostly law professors who were involved in drafting the CISG, and mostly law professors on all sides. <clears throat> there were really different approaches. The then socialist countries, so this is back in the 1970s when the Soviet Union was still around, uh, those socialist countries wanted a very, very clear mirror image last shot rule. Do you remember that from first year contracts? The U.S., the Germans uh, wanted a much more flexible approach, a, a more flexible approach that would be closer and understand exactly what's going on in the dynamics of these transactions, because nobody reads these standard business terms. Even all of the sophisticated people in this group, do you, when you click on the click here, if you've read the, all the terms and conditions box, do you actually read all the terms and conditions? It's the same sort of things with the, the battle of the forms. So the end result was, they, they I actually wrote my doctoral thesis on this very thing, and it, they just looked across the table at each other at one point and said, we're not going to be able to agree on this one. So we're just not going to say anything about it at all. And there is not a provision on this in the CISG. You can make arguments, and there's a lot of work done on trying to figure it out. Of course, it's kind of gone in different directions. Uh, but the bottom line is the CIS does not expressly answer this question. There is a right answer. I'd be happy to chat about it with you later. So. Third, where U.S. courts have come around, and there's now a growing international consensus, that standard business terms are to be treated differently than other kinds of contract terms. That is, the expressly negotiated contract terms. I have that quote there, uh, this uh, Roser Technologies court just really excellent, uh, detailed analysis of the question, looking at courts from around the world, looking at the drafting history, even, even looking at law professors' opinions on the subject. The court said that standard business terms are not, even if you expressly refer to them, are not necessarily effective. You will see this language to easily take note of them. Uh, that is, uh, in that specific case, what had happened, and there have been a fair number of these, the parties are exchanging communications, and there's a, a, just a line that says, our terms and conditions are available on our website. You have to go and read them. They're here. Just click on this link. And simply even clicking on the link, the court said, that's not enough. That is, you can't impose on the other side an obligation to go find out what your terms and conditions are even if it's part of your express interactions. And in this one, the, uh, the <coughs> seller had expressly referred to its uh, standard business terms. It said, our standard business terms govern, and it was the last communication, and our standard business terms are available on our website. Here's the link to our website. And the court said, nah, um, you formed a contract, but those standard business terms are not part of the contract. 
Okay. By the way, if people want to jump in with questions, have you take them along the way. Well, how different can CISG be? All right, it's international sales of transactions, but their sale of goods and sale of things for money, how different can it possibly be? Well, a lot different. The CISG, in many respects, the things I won't talk about here, but in many respects, is very different from the UCC. I'll, give, I'll highlight a few of them uh, as we move forward. I'll kind of move them there quickly. But it, is a, it was a massive compromise between socialist approaches and Western democracies and civil law and common law and developing countries and developed countries. So there are a lot of really different things in there. And uh, under the interpretive approach to <coughs> 7, we must consider the decisions of other member states. And rough count, there's about 10,000 decisions uh, on CISG around the world. One of the things that makes my skin crawl, you still see it in opinions in U.S. courts, the uh, U.S. courts saying, uh, there's very sparse case law on the CISG, <laughs> other than the 10,000 opinions. Um, so um, by that, they mean the U.S. Court opinions. There are now about 40 or 50 in the U.S. Excuse me, don't you think it's remarkable, considering how long it's been around, that there are only 40 or 50 in the United States? Yeah, so that, the site the CISG has the CISG? Yeah, so that's really, it's a really interesting phenomenon. But my, I don't know this as a matter of fact, but here's what I think is going on. People around the world are so afraid of our civil law system, and they think it's so expensive that most often they'll settle the cases because it's just too expensive. And the, the, why there are 10,000 opinions and only 50 in the U.S. is that most others, all of you will very likely know, in civil law systems, the civil procedure outside the United States is substantially cheaper and substantially faster, little or no discovery, so you can get a, a, a decision relatively Whereas with discovery and the costs, uh, so they, if there's not enough uh, money at stake, you just don't fight it in the U.S. Uh, whereas in Germany, uh, there probably won't even be an oral hearing, the submission of briefs, and cases over in three to four months. Much cheaper. Yeah. A quick question. Please. Is, is there a sort of consensus among practitioners that they do or don't want to be governed by the CISG or the UCC? Or yeah, there's actually a recent study done on this. Uh, and Practitioners in, in the U.S. in very large measure have tried to exclude the CISG. Um, no offense, uh, but it's not at all clear to me why anyone would do that, uh, other than it's different, it's strange. Uh, yeah, I'll give it, uh, don't, wanna, I, I, don't worry, I'm going to keep it in 40 minutes. I think it's a, it's a contract. Um, so, uh, yes, the, uh, I've heard different studies is 70% of standard forms included exclusion of CISG. Why one would do that without thinking about it is a mystery to me. It's entirely possible to opt in. Um, there have not been a lot of that. There's not been a lot of that. In negotiated transactions, I should say this on standard business terms, opting in. In negotiated transactions, I understand that speaking with the professor who does this, who does some crunching, number crunching, that it is increasingly common that rather if, if we're negotiating the deal, I'm not going to ins insist on U.S. law, you're not going <coughs> to insist on French law, let's just do the CISG, let's just agree on the CISG, and, and it's just one thing we don't have to fight about. So I'll go through this uh, relatively quickly, but I just want to point out that it's much easier. I use the word trap just to, for, to be provocative. The uh, it's much easier to form a contract under the CISG. First, no writing requirement of any kind. No form requirement of any kind. You absolutely can go and can do a $14 million sale over the telephone. No trouble whatsoever. Second, no parole evidence rule. That is, Section uh, 8.3, Article 8.3, expressly says, in interpreting even a final writing with a big, bold integration clause, the court must consider the negotiation of parties. And courts in the U.S. have been very good on recognizing this. There is no parole evidence. What you say during your negotiations can very much influence even a final writing. 
Third, I say goodbye to the objective interpretation. That, again, I'm being provocative. That the, this is very much a European civil law approach to interpretation that says we start off with subjective intent. As long as the other party could not have been unaware. It's a great phrase. If the other side could not have been unaware of your actual intent, um, then your actual intent governs. As you might imagine, in lots of circumstances, this can be really important. And courts in the U.S., uh, in particular recent courts, in the last six to eight years, U.S. courts have done, in large measure, a very good job of interpreting the CISG <clears throat> and recognizing that it requires an inquiry into subjective intent. So here's the point about, is excluding the CISG even a good idea? I just picked out a few examples, I just saw a couple of situations that one can make an argument that the, uh, not only an argument, I think it's actually true that CISG is better. So first, for sellers of goods. If your client is selling goods, the CISG is better because the CISG does not adopt the UCC's perfect tender rule. I just put that there, 2601, says if there's even the slightest defect, the buyer can reject the goods. I'll explain what that, the implications more in just a moment. Whereas under the CISG, the buyer can, in essence, require the seller to take the goods back or take responsibility for the goods only on a fundamental breach. What does that mean as a practical matter? If, your seller, if a seller is selling goods to a foreign uh, place, if the CI, I'm sorry, if the UCC governs, the goods arrive, there's the slightest possible defect. The buyer just says, I reject them. There's, the goods are sitting in some foreign port or some foreign place. As a seller, you kind of try to, to effect a cure, but of course then you have to effect the cure there, <coughs> or take the goods all the way back and pay the transportation costs to get them all the way back. Otherwise, the buyer just says, come back and take your goods, otherwise I'm going to put them outside my factory. Uh, whereas under the CISG, that can't happen. Of course, the buyer's going to have a breach of contract claim for damages, but the goods themselves, the buyer will have to keep, unless there's, a, again, a fundamental breach. Second thing, disclaimers of warranty. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. The, US, the uh, CISG doesn't use the word warranty, but in order to disclaim in the U.S., lots of detailed requirements under Article 2 for disclaiming warranties. In the CISG, it's just the, just to generalize what's the agreement of the parties. It's purely a question of agreement of the parties. Another advantage of the CISG is something, I just wanted to say this because it's a German phrase, not twist. This is a really innovative, I think a really clever way of solving the problem. In the, U in the US, if the other side, you think that they've breached the contract, you're not quite sure, you can do this request for an adequate assurance of performance, you'll re remember this from first year contracts, but there are all sorts of mushy terms, reasonable grounds, adequate assurance, commercial standards. You can never really know what your rights are. What the CISG does in contrast is it permits either party upon even the most minor breach can say to the other, I'm gonna give you two more weeks. If you don't fix this within the next two weeks, then there's a fundamental breach. And if it is not fixed within the two weeks, this uh, the courts have said two to three weeks is the, is the <coughs> additional period of time. You set this additional period of time. You breach now. It's minor. I'm not quite sure if it's a fundamental breach, but I'm going to give you three weeks. In three weeks, you either fix it or I'm going to avoid the contract. And again, courts have said around two to three weeks is the, uh, of that period of time. And then the deal's off. You don't have to worry about being wrong because you set that three weeks, and if the, there has not been a complete cure in that three weeks, uh, then you just say the deal's off. Um, flexibility, contract adjustments is easier. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Contract adjustment is easier under the CISG. Can you go back one second? Oh, sure. I just, okay, absolutely. So, so um, what I think is really important about not free is that mm -hmm. in the common law contracts in the United States, I tell my students that there is a kind of game of chicken. Mm -hmm. And you never know 
whether there's really a repudiation unless they stop their feet and they say, no, 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 I'm not going to perform, which nobody is stupid enough to do, right? Mm, absolutely. So the goal of the uh, adequate assurance of performance was to give a better solution to that problem of no over-communication of an intention not to perform. And it does, but not free is more concrete. And, it, and does it also not avoid a, the problem of being at risk of being the first person to breach? That's exactly what it does for you. One, that's exactly right. With the, actually, I'm sorry. It's, it's such an important point. Yeah, no, I know no. you're under a time pressure, but it's such an important point. Five minutes. So I'm, 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 Gary yeah. says five minutes. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, uh, yes, this is, and this is this wonderful, it's, it comes from the German law, obviously, uh, and it's a wonderful innovation because it permits you to say, listen, I'll give you two weeks. At the end of that two weeks, if it's not fixed, we don't have to worry about whether you did you know, reasonable grounds for assurance or all of that. And in the, in the U.S., you could be wrong about requesting the assurance, and then you're the breacher. That's a problem. So, uh, yes, let me some contact modifications, easier. Did want to get to the almost completely unknown limitations convention. And I mean almost completely unknown. You, you might not, the, you may never have heard of this. There's a companion treaty to the CISG that governs what we would call the statute of limitations. And this is also a, a self-executing treaty. <clears throat> the U.S. ratified it. Only 23 other countries have ratified it, but I'll explain in a moment why that doesn't matter, as least as much. So the convention applies, because uh, I have five minutes, it applies basic same sort of things, sale of goods, pirates have their places of business in different states, <coughs> and then same thing as in the CISG, parties have their places of business in different states. But unlike the, the CISG, this possibility of using the contract, I'm sorry, the choice of law rules, if they point to just one country, what I mean by that is a, in a practical real world way, so that's the civil, it's a civil law way of saying choice of law rules. Why this matters is, if you file a lawsuit in the United States and the court says the law of Massachusetts governs this transaction, and any one of the 150 some other countries who are not member states, the other side's on the, from one of those other countries, the court says Massachusetts law governs, then this treaty governs. The statute of limitations treaty governs. As a result, I was telling uh, beforehand, I'm waiting for the big blockbuster case when a court says, oh wait, this treaty applies, not the UCC, and the statute of limitations in this treaty are different from those in 2725, and even though the statute of limitations has not run under the UCC, it has run under this treaty. And this treaty is just as binding as the CISG, uh, and there are, the key point about this is there are some differences. There are, it, it also has a four-year uh, statute of limitations, that's the same thing as in 2725, although some states have a six-year in 2725. Um, so there are differences, uh, and in some cases, I think some rather noteworthy differences. Last thing, I'm just going to have to just go through this. There are the input terms out there. Uh, there has never been a law professor who has spoken for for uh, less time than the audience wanted to hear, so I'm going to stop here. So. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor William Johnson. Uh, to be here today. 
Um, I was not a ranch hand. In <laughs> uh, I was, however, a farm kid on a family farm in a community of introverted Scandinavians in uh, northern Minnesota. Um, apparently, I'm the extrovert of the community, uh, which is to say that I will stare at the toes of your shoes rather than my own when I'm talking, when I'm talking to someone. And so I would prefer to stay hidden someplace in the corner uh, while giving this presentation, but uh, in all uh, seriousness, it's a real honor to be here today. Uh, this is my third visit to New England Law, and I have thoroughly enjoyed the interesting discussions that I've had uh, each time I've been here. Um, it's a sincere pleasure to be both back, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Uh, we've just heard uh, some very interesting and important information about the potential relevance of the CISG in certain sales transactions, and that really suggests the importance of careful planning in light of potentially applicable uh, law. Uh, of course, that ordinarily includes um, thought given to a, a carefully uh, chosen choice of law clause that specifically addresses whether the CISG applies or not, and that will affect the body of law that governs the contract, the body of law that fills the gaps, that identifies remedies, uh, and so on. And uh, I agree with the emphasis that has been uh, that has been given to the importance of that careful planning. Uh, but some risks don't go away no matter what the choice of law clause might say. And uh, today, I'm going to address some of the significant risks that arise in the context of international product distribution when the producer of the goods uses a local sales intermediary in a foreign jurisdiction as the means of getting the goods to market in that jurisdiction. And we'll see that the risks often exist, no matter what the parties say about choice of law. When a U.S. producer enters a new market and uses a, a local sales intermediary to do it, there is great potential for unexpected cost, often in, con in connection with the termination. Uh, there is unexpected and different liability exposure, uh, different from the liability exposure that the pr producer is accustomed to. Um, there are often limits on the producer's ability to make changes to the relationship even when there's a good business reason for making changes in respect of the network of sales intermediaries that that producer uh, has engaged. Um, and there can even be an inability to get out of an undesirable uh, relationship. Now, of course, some of those costs and limits could arise um, as a result of the written agreement itself, if the sales intermediary has negotiated some protections and so on. But the real challenge, the surprising challenge, comes from applicable law as we'll explore together over the next half hour. Uh, today, in order to do that, I'm going to try to do three things. Uh, first, I'll provide an overview of international product distribution so that we have a fundamental sense for what international product distribution is. Second, I'm going to identify uh, the key risks that are presented by something called protective legislation. Third, I'm going to discuss very briefly the risk of violating competition law when managing a network of sales intermediaries in a foreign jurisdiction. Now, to be sure, there are numerous other risks that uh, we could also talk about. Uh, we could talk about the risk of permanent establishment. We could talk about the risk of loss of intellectual property rights, or the risk of creating an accidental franchise, or an unintended employment relationship, and so on and so forth. Uh, there, there are a good many pitfalls and traps for the unwary in this area, but our time is limited, and I think the more important thing to do today is to come away with a healthy sense of some of the significant risks with a recognition that there are other risks as well. Um, these two risks, that is, the risk of protective legislation and the surprising way that competition law applies to management of a network of sales intermediaries are, are two of the of the especially uh, significant risks that lawyers and their clients navigating international commercial relationships uh, must know something about, in my view. At this point, I'll provide an overview of international product distribution through foreign sales intermediaries so that we have a fundamental sense for what, what that means. Um, and when we talk about using a foreign sales intermediary, this is really by way of contrast with something called foreign direct investment, I assume. At least some of you are familiar with FDI or foreign direct investment. Um, one way to enter a new foreign market is to enter it directly. 
by acquiring a controlling equity interest in an existing corporate entity in that jurisdiction through a merger or an acquisition, or by incorporating a brand new entity as a subsidiary that is incorporated under the laws of that jurisdiction, or by opening a branch office that will operate directly in that jurisdiction, and so on. Those are all examples of foreign direct investment. Uh, foreign direct investment is one way to enter a market. And it tends to require significant resources. Uh, there tends to be a fair amount of complexity. It tends to take time uh, to get the business started. Foreign direct investment exposes the foreign investor to something called permanent establishment and an obligation to pay income tax in the foreign jurisdiction. And there may be local laws in the local jurisdiction that limit the ability of outsiders to own businesses, at least in certain industries. Another way to proceed is to avoid a direct presence in the foreign jurisdiction and instead to operate through a, a local partner, a foreign sales intermediary. That means identifying an existing local business that can serve as that local intermediary. And in fact, foreign sales intermediaries are routinely used. There are good reasons for this. There are numerous advantages uh, that flow from, or at least can flow from, using a sales intermediary. Uh, local sales intermediaries tend to have good familiarity with the local market. Uh, that might relate to business customs. It could uh, relate to navigating hurdles that are in the way of, of getting business done. It might relate to understanding local tastes, or it might be as simple as having facility uh, with language and so on. Um, a local sales intermediary might have an established reputation in the local market, which can be helpful if the uh, US producer or other foreign producer uh, is not uh, well known in that market. Uh, the local on the ground sales intermediary may be in a better position to provide uh, support uh, to the customers once those customers are, are established. Uh, technical support, customer service, warranty service even, uh, and, and uh, that sort of support. Uh, now that's especially true for certain categories of sales intermediaries, but it, it can apply to most any intermediary. The local sales intermediary may be in a position to help manage the logistics involved with getting the goods uh, to their eventual destination. Um, and typically, engaging a local sales intermediary requires an investment, but only a modest investment relative to uh, FDI, or foreign direct investment. And if properly managed, um, using a sales intermediary can help to reduce the risk of permanent establishment. So for these reasons, and others, producers pretty routinely enter a new market by appointing uh, one or more sales intermediaries. But of course, it's not quite as simple as simply making the decision to enter a new market by appointing a sales intermediary there. There are very different models available that present different business considerations, uh, but also importantly, that present different legal risks. Uh, there are actually quite a few categories of sales intermediary that are recognized as a matter of uh, applicable law uh, in different jurisdictions. I'm going to simplify it a bit and identify two broad categories that will, as a general matter, capture most of these categories. Those two broad categories are agents and distributors. So when the model used is an agency model, uh, the producer is the principal in the agency relationship, and the sales in intermediary is the agent, often referred to uh, by the term of our sales representative or independent sales representative. Uh, but it uh, typically will be an agency relationship. Agents or sales representatives promote the goods in the territory that has been assigned to them. Um, agents uh, work hard to develop customer relationships. Agents solicit orders for the goods and pass those orders along to the producer. The agent has the direct presence in the foreign jurisdiction and does the hard work necessary to develop the market and find customers and keep them happy. But true agents never take title to the goods. Some kinds of agents might take custody of the goods. Some kinds of agents might sign a sales contract on behalf of the principal. But the sales transaction itself is ultimately a transaction that is entered into between the producer or, or the principal and the customer, albeit after the agent has developed the relationship. Title then passes directly from producer to customer. Now, typically, agents, by definition, will have some sort of agency authority, which can bind the producer 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis third parties uh, in that jurisdiction. The scope and nature of the authority, of course, will depend on applicable agency law. It's likely to depend uh, on the terms of the agreement as well. But in any event, the risk of third party liability based on the words or actions or omissions of the agent is real. As for compensation, um, agents typically receive commissions uh, measured as a percentage of the net invoice price of goods that are sold uh, in the designated uh, territory. Now, when the model that is used is a distribution model, distributorship model, uh, by way of contrast, the producer is sometimes called the supplier, the sales intermediary is ordinarily called the distributor. Uh, unlike agents, distributors do take title to the goods. Distributors actually buy and then resell the goods. As a result, the distributor has that direct contractual relationship with the uh, eventual customer. Now, a couple of things to note about a distribution model. Often we're talking about marked goods that are being commercialized in the local jurisdiction. What that means is the distributor has a license to use those trademarks. That could be an express license that's set forth in the distribution agreement, or it could be implied. But in any event, that distributor will have the right to use uh, the marks, possibly other intellectual property as well, although uh, in the traditional relationship, um, uh, a license of the trademarks will be um, uh, what's at issue. Uh, when structured and managed well, a distributor will typically have no agent, no agency authority, and will simply be an independent contractor. Um, in the written agreement, when there is one, uh, there will be limits placed on the distributor's activities, quite typically, and there will be duties imposed on the distributor. Uh, but most distributors will have a considerable amount of flexibility with respect to how they uh, run their day-to-day -day business operations. And of course, this varies across industries, it varies across producers who might have different business models that they prefer, but as a general matter, uh, this tends to be true. And of course, there's also a great deal more complexity uh, to it than, than this, but this overview hopefully should give us some context for thinking carefully about the risks that arise. Uh, so let's turn now to the second part and identify the key risks uh, presented by something called protective legislation. In this part, I'm going to describe a European Union law that applies to agents, and I'm going to describe a Puerto Rican law that applies to distributors. I acknowledge Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory, and, and so I, I don't mean to be glib or to suggest that, uh, that uh, somehow uh, it is formed. But when we, when we get to the uh, protective legislation, I'm hopeful that you'll see that because of its uh, onerous nature, um, it's, a, it's a, a, perhaps an apropos example. Uh, but first, the EU law. The EU law is known as the EU Directive on Commercial Agents. There's a much longer name. I'm happy to provide it if anyone would like to take a look at it. Um, as a directive of the European Union, it has to be implemented by uh, each of the currently uh, 28 member states. Uh, the EU Directive on Commercial Agents ac accomplishes primarily four things that uh, will be relevant for producers who are doing business in the EU all designed primarily to protect commercial agents. Um, first, in, in Articles 3 and 4, the directive identifies the fundamental duties uh, that the producer and the agent owe each other, and of course, it's primarily the duties that the uh, producer owes the agent uh, that are relevant. Under Article 5, these duties are non-derogable. This is important. And one of the things, again, going back to the, the last um, presentation and, and my first few remarks, um, one of the things that makes this area of the law fundamentally different and a little bit difficult um, sometimes for, for clients to understand uh, and uh, to navigate is that we will time and again encounter uh, requirements or prohibitions from which the parties are not free to derogate. Uh, and that makes it, um, of course, more important to pay careful attention to uh, the applicable body of law, no matter what choice of law uh, provision uh, may, uh, may provide. Um, now, the duties that are described in Articles 3 and 4 uh, create a floor, and only a floor. Any EU member state could impose additional duties that are binding on uh, principals or producers. And of course, the parties are always free to include in their agreement additional or more specific duties to, to the extent uh, that doesn't conflict uh, with existing duties. Um, and so the floor has to be complied with. The duties aren't all that onerous. They have to do with providing information, 
um, observing principles of good faith, uh, and the like. Um, it's important simply to be aware of them and to make sure that your clients are aware of them. The second thing that the directive does, it provides rules governing the payment of commissions. Remember, commissions are the primary way that sales representatives or agents are compensated. And so naturally, the directive specifically addresses this, this important aspect of an agency relationship. Um, the directive addresses the scope of the duty to pay. It addresses the timing of payments. It actually even addresses the amount of payments. However, this is one of those instances where uh, the directive acknowledges that the amount of remuneration that, that is payable um, could be established by party agreement. And so the amount that is contemplated in the directive is a gap filler, and it's specifically identified as such. But the scope of the duty to pay and the timing of payments include non-derogable provisions. Third, and this is especially important, um, the directive limits the principal's right to terminate. Now think about that. We're talking about a business-to-business -business relationship. We're not talking about a consumer transaction. Um, and yet, what the directive does is it places limits on the parties freely to negotiate for terms of termination that the producer can later enforce. Instead, the directive says these requirements must be satisfied, must be complied with with respect to termination, no matter what the contract provides. Uh, this EU directive on commercial agents, the first of the two that, that we'll discuss today, that we'll examine today, is actually on the end of the spe spectrum that is not especially onerous. That is really pretty easy to comply with. Um, and yet even this directive um, uh, uh, places limits on what the producer is allowed to do. Primarily, in this case, by requiring a notice period that is generally fixed by the length of time the agent has been an agent. And it's a significant amount of notice relative to what the default provisions of the written agreement might otherwise provide. Uh, um, uh, but still, it, it uh, doesn't prevent the producer from terminating the agent, it simply takes, uh, takes longer. But that brings me to the fourth and final thing that the directive does. The directive provides for payment of a termination indemnity. In other words, upon termination, the principal or the producer is obligated to compensate the agent. Now, notice that I didn't say in the event of breach, right? This is payable upon termination as an indemnity. The amount of that indemnity is determined by uh, a kind of a formula that looks at what the, uh, uh, the agent has been earning in average commissions over a recent period of time. But the point, the point is this. There is a cost that is placed on the producer by this directive that is in addition to the ordinary customary transaction costs that would not be expected in a jurisdiction that doesn't have this sort of protective legislation. Uh, payment of the termination indemnity doesn't prevent the agent from also seeking actual damages if there has been breach. Uh, this is a separate uh, sort of payment. Now, this scheme is quite typical of legislation that protects commercial agents, although the level of protection given agents in some jurisdictions is, is sometimes more. Um, but the idea is to uh, make uh, 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 the uh, uh, payment of, of the commissions uh, something that is a focus of the legislation, make sure it's done on time, uh, that it's done in the right amount, and so on, and to place limits on termination. Um, again, under the EU directive, a producer does have the ability and the right to terminate, but there are costs associated with doing so, and so the producer is likely to do a cost-benefit analysis before proceeding with termination. The producer might decide not to terminate as a result, or the producer might negotiate some sort of mutually agreeable separation agreement, uh, but regardless, the cost will affect that analysis. This sort of protective legislation is there because legislative bodies that have made the decision to adopt this sort of legislation believe that there's a risk of sharp practice by the producer. Suppliers will appoint a vulnerable uh, or perhaps even desperate intermediary in order to test the market or to develop a market and just when that market has finally been developed, the supplier will swoop in and take that market back from the intermediary, assign the market to a favored business associate or to an affiliated entity, or simply move into the market itself. And all of the intermediary's hard work, time, sweat equity, effort will be for nothing. And of course that risk uh, does exist, 
So these statutes often make termination a little bit more difficult by requiring notice and payment of a termination indemnity. Sometimes, sometimes the statutes make it a lot more difficult to terminate. Sometimes the statutes make it almost impossible uh, as a practical matter to terminate. And that's true in Puerto Rico. Uh, we'll take up the uh, Puerto Rico uh, uh, Dealers Act um, uh, next. Uh, but one final thing, uh, again, to emphasize is that many of the provisions of the EU directive, as well as other bodies of protective legislation, are either entirely non-derogable or non-derogable in part, uh, prohibiting any derogation that would harm the sales intermediary. Please. Just a you may have said this. Does the directive apply to uh, software licenses, services? <laughs> The question is, does the directive apply to software or does it apply only to goods? This is not limited to goods. This is focused on the nature of the relationship between the, and this, I'm talking about U.S. producers, but it's any producer operating within the European Union and the uh, intermediary that uh, the producer enters into the relationship with. And so the, the, the really critical question about when this applies is whether the intermediary qualifies as an agent under the definition of the of the directive. Okay, let's talk a, a little bit about the uh, Puerto Rico Dealers Act. Um, under this statute, the producer, uh, by the terms of the statute, cannot directly or inter indirectly perform any act detrimental to the established relationship. Think about that for a minute. The producer cannot directly or indirectly perform any act detrimental to the established relationship without just cause. Uh, in, in addition, um, specifically, the producer cannot even refuse to renew without just cause. This actually looks very similar to uh, a law in the state where I practiced before I entered academics, the state of Wisconsin, which has adopted something called the Wisconsin Fair Dealership Law. Uh, my clients were very, very surprised indeed uh, to discover uh, that a law that applies to a business-to-business -business contract uh, could uh, place such uh, tremendous uh, limits on the producer's ability to manage its relationship uh, with its uh, producer. Um, so this general prohibition makes it very, very difficult to do the sorts of things that a producer might otherwise like to do um, unless that producer can, producer can show just cause. Now, of course, good lawyers are all about practical solutions that help their clients achieve their business objectives, even when there's some statutory scheme that's making it difficult uh, to do that. And business clients, of course, typically will want to retain, well, as much flexibility as they, as they reasonably can with respect to implementing changes uh, in the distribution network uh, to get rid of bad performers or to adopt a, a new model. Um, written agreements will often be drafted in a way that Producers will have the right upon reasonable notice, usually, uh, sometimes specifically when they articulate a business rationale for doing so. That's a matter of negotiation. But in any event, will retain the right uh, to make uh, changes uh, as and when it makes sense to do so, as well as to uh, terminate uh, the relationship when it makes sense to do so. Uh, the client is not going to want to have to worry about, about having to show just cause. Well, one solution that you might consider is to define just cause, define it in the contract, and to define it broadly, including, for example, any breach of the contract by the dealer, or even to include a decision by the, by the producer to change its business model for that jurisdiction, or, or maybe to leave the jurisdiction altogether. From the perspective of the producer, each of those things ought to constitute just cause, especially when the producer is behaving in a way the producer deems to be uh, reasonable, um, communicates openly, gives notice, and so on. But of course, as you can imagine, that's not reasonably possible here because just cause is defined by statute. I'm not going to take the time to read it, but it is defined very narrowly uh, to very limited circumstances that will actually constitute uh, just cause. And so uh, a producer, a grantor as it's called in the language of the act, um, may not terminate, may not commit any act detrimental to the relationship, may not even refuse to renew the agreement. You're stuck. You're stuck with this intermediary once this intermediary is appointed. Now, I want to be sure we understand what's potentially at stake here. 
The parties could enter into a contract that they agree will last for, say, three years. The supplier might perform perfectly under the agreement for those three years. The intermediary might abide by the terms of the agreement, but not be an especially strong performer. At the end of the three-year period, um, the supplier, the producer, might give the intermediary a significant amount of notice of its intent not to renew the agreement, to let it expire by its terms. Uh, the producer might even take extraordinary steps and offer to buy back inventory and offer to, at its expense, um, help the intermediary transition the intermediary's uh, business to some other business model. And despite all of that, the dealer will still have a cause of action against the producer under the Puerto Rico Dealers Act for failing to renew the agreement. Now, this isn't about whether this is good law or bad law. Um, I have some views about that, but I don't think my views are especially important. I think what matters is that this is the risk, and it affects how you should advise your clients who are engaging in business transactions in jurisdictions that, that feature this sort of protective, language, uh, uh, protective legislation. It's about business planning in light of the applicable law. <clears throat> now, uh, according to the terms of the Puerto Rico Dealers Act, choice of law clause won't do it. Arbitration outside Puerto Rico won't do it, at least not automatically. And litigation outside Puerto Rico won't do it automatically as well. There is some US case law that has pulled back on these provisions a bit. Um, when the Puerto Rico dealer has signed a choice of form clause outside of Puerto Rico, for example. But even so, the protections are expressly non derogable It would be a mistake to assume the producer could win a race to a friendly courthouse to persuade the court to disregard the statutory protections. Now, not every jurisdiction around the world has enacted protective legislation, but a good many have. Not all of the protective legislation that's out there uh, and has been enacted is non-derogable, or even especially onerous. Quite a bit of it is, and uh, it's important to note that. This doesn't mean don't do business in Puerto Rico. It means do it with your eyes wide open to the additional risks. Draft the agreement carefully in light of the applicable law, and manage the relationship effectively. That's critically important. Um, I think my time is growing short. We, we don't have time to get into the, uh, the competition law. Let me simply note that um, if you look at the competition law scheme in the US, uh, over the years, um, something called the rule of re reason has emerged that allows producers to manage their distributors in a way that US producers take for granted. Um, that includes telling the distributor, I'm assigning you for uh, the state of Iowa. Don't sell outside the state of Iowa. I'm assigning to you certain customer groups. Um, don't resell to anyone outside those customer groups, and so on. Territorial restrictions, customer restrictions, product restrictions, and so on that are absolutely commonplace in a US-style distribution arrangement. Similarly, there are other restrictive covenants that, again, we, we simply take for granted in a US approach to a distribution arrangement whether it's an exclusive dealing arrangement or a covenant not to compete or some other restriction on what the distributor is allowed to do. In many jurisdictions around the world that have robust competition law, um, that will get your client into quite a lot of trouble. Uh, the agreement, um, is uh, either in whole or in part, is likely to be rendered void, uh, and the, uh, the producer uh, will be subject to uh, fines and penalties that can be very, very large. Um, Korea uh, has robust competition law. Uh, Japan does as well. Uh, Taiwan does as well. Every member state in the European Union uh, does. Um, and if we have more time, I, I'd give you a little bit more uh, flavor of the EU approach, uh, but we can talk about that um, uh, during a break, if you like, um, uh, uh, or uh, uh, at the end of the day. Instead, uh, let, me just, um, let me just wrap up. Because I, in addition to being an extrovert Scandinavian, I'm also, I'm also an optimist, and this is, uh, <laughs> this is, this is heavy stuff. And so um, here's the upshot of all of this, in, in my view. This really, truly is not an admonishment not to engage in business in frightening jurisdictions with robust protective legislation or sophisticated competition law, not at all. US producers and other producers engage in successful business transactions in such jurisdictions all the time. 
um, and they do it very effectively. You know, instead, this, this really is intended to be a message of optimism, and here's why. Thoughtful lawyers who are familiar with the risks can help educate their clients so that the clients are positioned to make sensible business decisions. Producers and other business clients understand that there's risk. They, they get that. Lawyers are risk averse uh, by, by nature. Uh, businesses are, are much more comfortable with risk. They want some help identifying what the risks are. They want some help identifying creative ways to navigate that risk. As we become increasingly globalized, this is likely only to expand. That's a good thing. For those of us who are internationally minded, sitting in this room right now, it creates opportunities. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll close. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I'll just speak from right here. I you all can see me, and uh, I can see all of you. So I've been asked to, uh, to speak about the dark side of uh, <laughs> cross-border transactions, when risk turns into dispute, uh, and how you can plan for it. Because there is a transactional focus to today's uh, conference. I thought that I would try to uh, spend my time with you in uh, looking at the kind of contractual provisions that you can build in to provide some of the certainty and predictability, or at least give you a shot at it, uh, if uh, that downward spiral, spiral occurs and you find yourself uh, in, in a dispute. Now, what are the chances? Uh, well, you know, where business goes, disputes follow. It, it just happens. And there have been an awful lot of societies that have been uh, dispute adverse, but uh, when they've done enough business with us, they've uh, adjusted. And uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the uh, effects of uh, globalization has been um, a rise in dispute resolution and the types of cases that are uh, finding their way not only into courts, but into a private system of justice uh, that is arbitration. And I've been asked to spend you know, 20 to 30 minutes with you today speaking about that. And, and I have to say in candor that uh, really that's that's more time than I got with some of my partners on transactions when, you know, uh, it would have been very helpful to uh, to take those moments uh, and, and try to give a thoughtful approach to a uh, contractual provision where you're heading into waters that are filled with icebergs. You know, I mean, there's... Uh, a lot that is invisible about this process because of the confidentiality associated with, you, with it. Uh, and I'll try to lift the veil a little bit for you uh, in today's remarks. I will say, though, that uh, when you get to that uh, time where a dispute arises, uh, and even though you may have spent little or no time on the dispute resolution clause at the transactional negotiating stage, uh, what you have is, in many instances, a transactional lawyer having one of those, oh my God, moments. You know, what did I agree to? What have I gotten us into? And we're still a client saying that to the transactional lawyer. Uh, so I'd like to spend a few minutes trying to uh, aid you in making informed judgments, uh, because you will have the opportunity to seize advantage to position your client uh, to deal from a position of strength and addressing some of the risks that have been paraded before you. Uh, now, how do you go about it and, and, and why do you go about it? I mean, why can't you just have a race to the courthouse? Well, for one, you don't always win. Uh, two, uh, there are plenty of societies that we do business with where if the other side wins the race to the courthouse, you are not looking at speedy justice. You are looking at 10 years in the court system. Try Spain, try Japan. Um, so, you know, you have to think about how do you uh, create a dispute resolution process that gives you some uh, speed, if you will. Uh, hopefully, some economy as well. Uh, in any event, uh, why else might you look at opting out of the national court systems and into a private system of justice like arbitration? Well, there's one real good reason, uh, and that is the 1958 New York Convention on the Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. There's a treaty out there, and guess what? About 
150 odd countries have signed on to it. So that if I sit as an arbitrator in a suit and tie in a room like this and I preside over an arbitration and I render my award, you have a better chance of enforcing that award than if I was sitting in black robes having been confirmed by the United States Congress. So, uh, do you feel lucky? <laughs> do you want to win the race to the courthouse, or do you want um, maybe to hedge your bets a little bit and, and see what you can do with the contractual stage in a forum selection clause? Now, that forum selection clause may well involve opting for a court. Uh, it depends. You have to make judgments, but I think for most of you in a sale of goods um, scenario, uh, you are likely to be confronted with a foreign party that has an expectation uh, of um, opting into a uh, arbitration uh, process and opting out of the national court system, uh, in part because they have the fear of God in them about our court system and our jury system and our discovery system and the expense associated with it. So um, unless you have uh, the commercial leverage to impose your will, um, and that's not always the best way to um, start off a new commercial relationship, uh, you're going to probably listen to the other side, and you're going to think about what are the advantages to my side of opting into an arbitration um, proceeding. You can do it um, in one very effective way. It has to be an agreement in writing under the New York Convention. Okay, so that's your starting point. And how do you create an effective agreement to arbitrate? Well. I can spare us all a lot of time. I mean, you can just go onto the website of countless arbitral institutions around the globe, and there's been a proliferation of them. Uh, and they all typically have a website, and they have model clauses, and they are calculated to give you an enforceable agreement to arbitrate. Uh, and that's a good thing, uh, because uh, you can get yourself into some trouble by trying to be too creative. At the same time, uh, you know, why might you want to opt out of a model clause and uh, try to customize it a bit? Well, um, it's an opportunity to seize advantage. Uh, why defer to others' uh, decision on some aspects of the dispute resolution process that will matter to you a great deal down the road when you could have had it decided your way in part of the initial negotiation? A lot of times there really isn't much of a negotiation. There's just sort of a back and forth of draft form selection clauses. And so there's not a lot of um, chitter chatter. And uh, you know, if you're dealing with somebody in Europe, they might say, well, I want an ICC arbitration clause, an International Chamber of Commerce arbitration clause. It's very uh, comfortable uh, for a European party. Uh, the American party may sit there and say, well, I don't want to go sit blind by the lake in Geneva. But, um, you know, London has its attractions, uh, included among them are they speak the English language, and that sort of thing. So, you know, there are some trade-offs, but usually you're operating within the framework of uh, the starting point that you're, you're going to agree to arbitrate. Um, now, does that mean that you have to, if the dispute arises, uh, have to go right into that process? Because it's adversarial. Uh, it may not be quite as adversarial as uh, you know, a courtroom. Uh, you may not have quite the same uh, tenor of cross-examination, if you will. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's, it's more than a transactional negotiation. So uh, there is a degree of formality associated with it. Unless uh, you get to that process, one of the starting points is typically what we call a step uh, ladder approach. You escalate slowly but surely. Um, you know, one of the techniques is you have a meet and confer between executives of the companies involved. Uh, phone, video, in person, whatever works, whatever makes economic sense. But usually you try to take it out of the hands of the people who have been implementing the agreement. Um, they tend to be emotionally involved uh, and have uh, decided views about uh, what the other side is doing and how they're behaving. Uh, they're not paying, and our goods were perfectly fine. A couple of cracks here and there, but no big deal. 
uh, certainly not a fundamental breach. So uh, you may go up through that process. Uh, you can escalate it by having a professional a mediator involved who will come in and try to um, go through a process with the parties. But bottom line is uh, you do not want that dispute percolating too long. So a time limit is the kind of thing that you would build into it. Um, you have to be careful with time limits, whether they be for a stepladder you know, clause like I'm describing or for an arbitration itself. I have encountered contracts uh, where the transactional lawyer thought they were doing a good deed by saying, um, a final award shall be rendered within 90 days of the notice of dispute. Uh, great, you know, speed is a, uh, a good thing most of the time, but if you're fighting over a billion dollar license portfolio, you know, you might want to rethink that 90 day timeline because you put it in the contract, you live with it. Uh, and I did have such a uh, billion dollar dispute and I did have the 90 day clause and I was a sole arbitrator and neither side would blink. So, you know, it, we, it was very easy to create the process. I have a deliverable that's due in 90 days. You're going to work very hard to get me there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, forewarned is forearmed. Uh, then you have another fundamental choice, that is, um, do I want to have an institutional arbitration to conduct it under the um, auspices of one of these private uh, entities that have time and tested rules in many instances, sometimes uh, decades in the making, uh, or do I want to engage in what one might call an ad hoc arbitration where we agree to have an arbitration, we just don't fill in all the blanks. Uh, it's not going to be under somebody's auspices because we don't want to pay for it. Because there is a price associated with private justice. Uh, that said, uh, one of the great national and international pastimes these days is how you avoid paying too much. And uh, the technique of preference is to request declaratory judgments rather than say we have a billion dollar patent license dispute. We have a dispute over certain rights and obligations that has arisen under this patent license. Uh, and so you say that to the arbitral institution and they don't charge you as much. At the same time, because they don't think it's such a big deal, they say, oh, well, you're going to get a sole arbitrator rather than three arbitrators, because it doesn't appear to be that large or complex a case. It's once again, where you have to ask yourself, do I feel lucky? It's one of those penny-wise and pound-foolish kinds of moments. Um, you don't always get to make that choice. You want to do business uh, with a Chinese entity? No ad hoc arbitration if it's going to be cited in China, okay? And, you know, you, you have different approaches uh, in contracts, and sometimes they'll, a contract will say, if you're the claimant, you the American company or the claimant, then we'll park the arbitration in our homeland, in China. And if the Chinese party is the claimant, then we'll park it in New York or Boston or wherever. So, you, uh, you have to be mindful of the fact that there are um, rules that society imposes, mandatory norms. Uh, and uh, just because the parties say that we agree to an ad hoc arbitration in Shanghai doesn't mean you can have one there. Um, the Chinese government will have something to say about that. You will not have an enforceable arbitration agreement. Uh, similarly, there were a number of societies that used to say uh, you cannot agree to arbitrate and to opt out of the national court system prior to the dispute arising. Oh, great, so I'm in a death struggle with the, the buyer and I have to agree after the fact when they've won the race to the courthouse that oh, you really don't want to proceed there, why don't we just have a nice arbitration? And so an, an arbitral institution developed out of that uh, set of circumstances called the International Chamber of Commerce, and they had rules where basically you could agree in your contract to arbitrate, but then as soon as the arbitration commenced, you put together a document signed by the parties and the arbitrators that memorialized the agreement to arbitrate, and that satisfied that kind of mandatory norm in, in various jurisdictions. There is not as much of that going around uh, these days. Uh, most societies have come around to the view that you can agree to opt out of the court system, 
But the legacy of that is a particular procedure with the ICC that uh, adds to the expense, uh, yet enhances the finality of the award and makes it more likely to be enforceable. So, you know, you, you get these trade-offs, and one of the choices you make is not only between it, whether to have an institutional arbitration or an ad hoc arbitration, but also which institution, because there are lots of them out there. In a um, sale of goods transaction here in the States, uh, the American party would be most likely to be looking at uh, the American Arbitration Association, they have this International Center for Dispute Resolution. They spell center, C-E-N-T-R-E, to give it kind of <laughs> a foreign flair, make it not so American, but everybody knows what's going on. Uh, can't fool all the people all the time. Uh, and there's a Center for Public Resources. Uh, that's more of a Fortune 50, Fortune 100 kind of outfit. Uh, uh, you have um, uh, Jams, uh, that's another uh, domestically based, largely uh, institution, but you can write it into your uh, contract. They have international rules. Most of their panel of arbitrators uh, tend to be former judges, but not all. Um, uh, you have to be a little bit careful uh, uh, in deciding about other foreign arbitral institutions. Uh, uh, there are uh, opportunities galore, and there's a global competition for where to park your arbitration. It's big business. Uh, you can have a center in Cairo. You can have a center in Bahrain. You can have the AAA, American Arbitration Association, with offices in Bahrain to administer your uh, arbitration. The downside is that office may be located 200 yards from where demonstrations are going on and troops are firing on civilians. Um, because stuff happens in places. And so uh, where you cite your arbitration takes a certain amount of foresight. Um, Baghdad did not play well for a long time. Um, I had Washington, D.C. Um, uh, the third week of um, September night in 2001. Uh, the Japanese party was not anxious to fly into Washington with the Pentagon still smoldering. How about Montreal? Well. Food's good. Uh, only you know an hour or two away on the plane. Yeah, that, maybe we could do that. Um, I've also uh, uh, frequently advocated for seasonal arbitration clauses, where if there are going to be wintertime hearings, there should be in a you know French Caribbean island or something. Like that. I have never gotten anyone to take that yet. But um, you know, think about Boston's winter two years ago. He would have made that trade you know, in a second. Anyway, um, you're going to be given a number of opportunities to make those kinds of decisions. Where do we park the arbitration? Does it matter? Well, yes, it does. Um, and how you do it matters. Um, I had uh, one client who wanted uh, to opt for, told me that they had uh, agreed to arbitrate uh, in Geneva, uh, or I'm sorry, in Paris. And I said, well, why did you? How did, how did you do that? And I said, well, you know, we, my wife and I have never been to Paris. <laughs> you know, if, if the sale of the particular equipment didn't go well and we had to fight about it, Paris would be nice. So I looked at the contract and it said, sure enough, you know, that the arbitration would be governed by the ICC rules of the Court of Arbitration in Paris. It's just that that's where the arbitral institution is located. Um, unfortunately, there was another sentence that, that said the sites of the arbitration will be Geneva. So I said, you know, the only way you're going to Paris is if you route your flight to Geneva through Paris, either on the way over or on the way back, but you'll still be drinking French wine, and there are a lot of French spoken, and it's almost the same, but not quite. Um, with those kinds of decisions, um, you know, people make mistakes all the time. Uh, one of the big areas of focus is the scope of the arbitration. What are you agreeing to arbitrate? Uh, because people don't always agree to arbitrate everything. Uh, sometimes it's a very compartmentalized approach. You could have uh, some kind of sale where, really, it's kind of numbers crunching and you want an accountant to, um, to make the call. Uh, in another instance, it could be that that number crunching has to be really informed by uh, contractual interpretation. And so, 
Do you just want a sole arbitrator who's an, an accountant? Or do you want a panel of arbitrators? And maybe one's an accountant and one's uh, got very substantial contractual experience in your industry. And one uh, maybe is the chair and knows how to run the show. Uh, it's always tempting to look uh, at the contract and say, well, you know, if we're going to arbitrate, we'd really like to have somebody with expertise in the area. That's part of the process that's supposed to be brought to bear on this kind of problem solving to do it effectively. You have to remember, though, that with expertise comes bias. I mean, these people didn't become experts in their field without experience. They've been through a lot, and while they may know how things work, they may have a particular view of how things work. And so you have to be careful in uh, describing in a contract, for example, an arbitrator's qualifications. That's one thing to be wary of. Uh, you know, another is how you describe it. Uh, I've certainly seen contracts that uh, said, you know, uh, there shall be a, a sole arbitrator who will be a former, who will be a United, former United States attorney, who not less than, than 20 years, or shall be a United States attorney with not less than 20 years experience. Okay, so then you see a group of people put before you for the choice, and they're all criminal lawyers because everybody thinks what they were picking was somebody out of the, you know, who was an assistant U.S. attorney uh, in the local office, and really, no, they just wanted somebody who was a United States citizen and a lawyer. Uh, I've had other instances where somebody wanted a dual citizen of the United States and Canada. There was one person who satisfied that criterion on the panel of arbitrators of the American Arbitration Association. And uh, as it turned out, it was the former employer of my client. Uh, so the other side wasn't really keen to proceed on that basis. You end up fighting about these things. And, and so part of the point here is, while you have an opportunity to seize advantage, the way that you do it uh, can cost a lot of money. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier the scope of the arbitration. That's one such area that can be very, very expensive. You think we agreed to arbitrate this dispute. And so maybe we'd say any dispute arising um, in connection with this agreement shall be arbitrated. How much harm can that do, right? Um, any dispute arising under this contract shall be arbitrated. Is that the same thing? Not necessarily. Would a fraud in the inception claim be included under the second uh, formulation of the scope of language? Uh, not everywhere. <laughs> not everywhere. And so jurisdiction is something that gets challenged a lot, in part because it's one of the few areas that you can tip an arbitrator. And one of the things you have to bear in mind when you go into this process is that as enforceable as an arbitral award may be, uh, the desire is to have finality um, and to have speed and to have economy. And, uh, you know, <laughs> if you get somebody who doesn't um, quite get it and uh, makes a bad mistake of law or fact, well, uh, you could be out of luck. Um, whereas you'd say, you know, that never would have happened to me in a court. Now, there are many in house counsel who you may end up working with who. Uh, will be skeptical about arbitration because of the limits on oversight. One of the answers that the system has developed is to have private um, appellate arbitration. You can, for example, have um, a very fast track uh, appeal before a sole arbitrator, and the qualifications can be that they're a retired um, you know, court of appeals um, federal judge. Uh, and they're used to reviewing records for law and for fact, and that can satisfy it. So there's lots of techniques out there. Uh, you just have to bear in mind that if you don't choose uh, to do it in the right way, uh, that it's going to be a fight. And a fight is time, and a fight is money. Now, clearly one of the most important decisions that you ever make in the process is choosing your arbitrator. And so you have to look very closely at how under a particular rules, an arbitrator is, is chosen. Um, there are, um, under the ICC approach, there's a national committee. And so if there's a sole arbitrator to be chosen, how does that arbitrator get picked by the US National Committee? I can tell you that when my um, law firm joined the 
uh, local affiliate of the ICC to help them build their presence in New England, I assume was appointed on two cases as sole arbitrator. Uh, you know, it's a mystery to me how that works sometimes, but um, do you want to take that approach, or do you want to take an approach under a different arbitral institution that may give you a list of arbitrators based on the description of the case? And in those circumstances, do you want to pick all three from that list? Or do you really want to have an opportunity to have somebody who you know will understand your position sitting on that panel and in the room at the end of the day when the decision is made? You have that opportunity at the contracting stage. You can provide for party-nominated arbitrators. Each side picks one. They pick a third. What happens if they don't agree on a third? Um, does the institution pick them? There's various scenarios that can occur. So you have to you know, know enough to look at the rules to know what happens and whether to provide for it in your agreement to arbitrate. I have had more than one nine or ten figure uh, arbitration chairperson picked on a coin flip. You know, the parties just couldn't agree. Uh, the party nominated arbitrators just couldn't agree. And so, uh, is that a good thing? <laughs> well, again, you've got to feel lucky. I, um, I frequently will say about choosing an arbitrator that uh, you know, if you ever saw Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade the movie, there's a scene where there's an old uh, knight uh, from medieval times, and there's a chalice, and you have to pick the right chalice. And if you drink out of the correct chalice and you drink the waters, uh, life is good, your wounds are healed, everything goes on famously. And if you don't uh, pick the right chalice, you die a horrible death. <laughs> and so, you know, in the movie, the, the person picks up the chalice, drinks it, thinking all is good, and dies a really horrible death with the best graphics that Hollywood could provide at the time. Uh, and then Harrison Ford comes in, and somebody drinks it, and it all is good. And, you know, the knight sits there and goes, ah, he chose wisely. And so you always have to ask yourself, you know, Am I going to choose wisely? Um, how do I make that choice? Um, an informed process, an informed choice is a good thing, but if all else fails, um, look, you want an effective agreement, you want an agreement that you know won't generate a lot of fighting, you just go on the web, you know, pick the clause for the institution, do a little shopping around, ask. You know, somebody who knows, well, why would I pick ICC, or can I pick Hong Kong? Can I have an ad hoc arbitration outside of China that will be enforced in China? Because that would be cheaper for me to do. There are a lot of nuances, and that's why I gave you sort of that iceberg image at the beginning of my remarks, that uh, an awful lot happens below the surface. And that brings me back to confidentiality, which is one of the last things that you might address in your contract. Uh, you might sit there and think, well, you know, I'm opting for arbitration. That's confidential. That's, that's the, the rap about it. But if you look in the United States, uh, the confidentiality provisions in, say, the AAA's rules apply to the arbitrator and they apply to the institution. They don't expressly pro you know, uh, uh, provide that the parties have to abide by them. And so a lot of people will build that into their contract. Um, if you're going to arbitrate in some place like England, uh, you don't have to because it's regarded as confidential. But you know, are you going to know that, other than the fact that I just told you? No. Um, there's all sorts of trouble you can get into. You can sit there and say, all right, let's arbitrate in England. They have confidential arbitrations and they speak English. That would be a good thing. And we'll pick the ICC rules, and that will make our European buyer happy. But did you know that by doing that, you just waived your right of appeal? Because England is the only country that has um, interpreted the ICC rules in a way that um, uh, provides uh, that there's a waiver of the right of appeal if you pick the ICC rules. Now, other countries haven't interpreted it that way. And so, you know, your partner who's been picking England and ICC on a compromise that made everybody happy for 20 years sits there and goes, I've just been committing malpractice for 20 years. I never told my client that they were waiving their right of appeal. Uh, 
Have I made you all enthused about the prospects of trying to draft the contract? Yeah. This is how I get paid. I have to interpret these things. People fight about them. That's how you get paid as the advocate. But your job as the transactional draft people, your job as the in-house counsel is to manage this negotiation in a way where that doesn't happen. And you know, um, plenty of uh, places you can try to seize advantage. There are plenty of places you can just step into all kinds of trouble. So better safe than sorry, but chances are good that's the process that you're going to find yourself um, in in a uh, cross-border transaction involving the sale of goods, and certainly it extends well beyond that to joint ventures, collaboration agreements, you name it. While uh, if you're a reader of the New York Times, arbitration is under attack in the consumer context, in the labor context, employment, to a lesser degree in investor state um, matters. You don't hear a lot about it being under attack in business to business um, deals. You hear it criticized for maybe being more expensive and time consuming than it used to be, but the kinds of cases that the process is now handling, uh, in fairness, require more time and more process. So. Uh, that's the lowdown, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to try to answer them. Let's give one more round of applause to the entire panel. Thank you. I'm going to take the liberty of talking for about two minutes, maybe three. First of all, these were really, really excellent presentations and I think exceptionally clear. But I want to add one thing from our, my own days in rather humble practice, and that had to do with an arbitration proceeding. And it has to do with uh, Philip O'Neill's caution about picking arbitrators. We were arbitrating a dispute having to do with a massive rural water system in certain subsurface conditions. And we picked the arbitrators off of a list provided by the AAA, American Arbitration Association. And the way it worked is if somebody was unsatisfactory, you struck with the instructor, you ended up hopefully with somebody with a panel of three, which we did. And my senior partner thought that this one uh, contractor whom he had known would be a really good arbitrator, so we left him on. It was an intense, hard arbitration. About three days in, to add a little levity, Based on a conversation we'd had with one of the witnesses, we thought we'd put on a little a skit. It was intended as a jest uh, to, to, to lighten up the proceedings. And it had to do with this thing, I think you call it a witching wand, like you discover some water underground. And to our all amazement, we saw one of the panelists, instead of laughing, he started taking notes. And all of a sudden, my partner said, this guy thinks it's not only relevant, he thinks it's real. This is awful. <laughs> and so we made some calls, and they said, holy smokes, you left him on there? He's gone completely see us. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, You've got to be careful yeah, whom you pick. Somebody could be really out of touch. We had a six-week trade secret fight, and it was very complex software. And in the opening argument, they're talking about the user's manual, and the wing arbitrator says, excuse me, counsel, what's a user? <laughs> and, you know, the look of horror on their face at how much they'd have to dumb it down. I mean, we weren't talking about using drugs here. This is a guy who just did not get it. So, I mean, you learn to play to your audience. But. No, any other questions? Yeah, please. I was just wondering about bankruptcy. One party goes into bankruptcy effect on the arbitration. And in drafting the clause, do you have any ability to sort of draft it in a way to keep out or some issues out of there? You know, in the course that I teach, uh, the last, that we spent a semester trying to figure out how to have an enforceable arbitration clause. And the uh, last case that studies involves bankruptcy and how to get out of an arbitration clause when you have to. Um, and uh, long story short, if you're going um, into Chapter 7, you're going to have a flood pull, uh, then chances are pretty good that uh, the uh, arbitration clause may well be upheld. If you're in Chapter 11 and there's an effort to uh, try to get the, um, the party back on their feet, uh, the court is more zealous in guarding its own uh, jurisdiction and the tendency is to keep the case. <clears throat> can make a huge difference in terms of uh, what law gets applied, how the law gets applied, and the like. So, uh, first thing that will happen is the bankruptcy will stay the arbitration. And 
and then you have to sort of see how the bankruptcy plays out. And if it's a seven, he may revisit the forum selection. Eleven, you're with your bankruptcy judge. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I may mention later how uh, CISC played into the attempted uh, revision of Article Two, but uh, I just want to ask you whether. Uh, in those 10,000 other cases, uh, do you know whether any of them have been applied to software? Uh, yeah, there's been a fair number, uh, and they pretty much follow the same approach that U.S. courts have followed. That is, if, you, if it's delivered in a physical medium, then the CIA issue applies. If not, then not. Uh, but even with regard to the physical medium, some courts have said the CIA issue doesn't apply. Uh, to mass market, but may apply to specific individual. Uh, but that, I suspect, is a question that is rapidly decreasing in significance because the, how often you buy physical media software. But in general, no, of course, the courts have said uh, if it's pure software delivered over the internet, the CISG is not online. Are there any other questions? observations. Well, we're exactly on schedule. Uh, please reconvene at 3 o'clock, but I do want to say again my heartfelt, deep thanks for the excellence of your presentations. I know you take a lot out of your day, a lot out of your week to come and make this presentation, so from all of us here, thank you very, very much, and we reconvene at 3 o'clock.